discussion, man, just for you, since you're you're one of my masters, you're a prosecutor in Ohio. We're going to let you. I'm going to stay on here until 10 o'clock and then strictly at 10, I'm getting off of here. Well, I certainly uh, wouldn't consider myself the master of anybody, but okay. to, <laughs> to counter your point there, the Declaration of Independence was ratified by Congress after the passing of the second or of the Constitution we have now, but that didn't make it a law. They recognized the document, but it's not legally binding. And that's a distinction I don't think a lot of people either know about or understand. But I think that I look, I'll be honest with you, Paul, you may be right. I'm gonna look it up, but it was Judge Andrew Napolitano that told me that. So that's that's why I trust it because it was the judge that told me. But you may be right. We'll look it up. And so. don't get me wrong; it's certainly one of the most uh, profound and influential documents on the spirit of the law. But it is not legally binding itself. But to not throw any directly combative questions at you, I I was wondering: say your anarchic vision for society comes true. What, I mean, I assume you wouldn't be auditing on a YouTube channel if that were to happen. So what would you do? I'd probably go back to my forte. I'd probably sell, sell the best weed in the land. And by the way, I did look it up, Paul. And, you know, I'm not a legal scholar. I know I, I made a claim to that in my most recent video, but I was mostly talking out my ass. But it, it does say here that Congress placed the declaration at the beginning of the U.S. Code. Now, I don't know if that means that it is a law, but it is in the U.S. Code. So what, I mean... Yeah, I mean... I don't know what that means. I'm kind of like asking, could you clarify, tell me what that means? Well, I don't it's, know. It, it is part of the U.S. Code, but that doesn't mean that it's a law like the various sections of the u.s code after it like there, there's the code or the u.s codes will list no person shall do x y or z that's not how the declaration of independence is written out to be so there's not okay. Okay. there's not like a legal enforceable provision within it because i mean it was essentially just a great big well, middle finger to the king of england the just the just powers of government are derived from the consent of the governed so one might find that to be legally binding uh, against the government right but, but let's we not debate on that politicians. we could we could we could talk about that and it, i mean i'm coming up here again i'm sure you'll be available so we can talk about that later but did you have more questions about anarchy uh and I, well, I apologize anything. if this has been asked before, but I would question you about the monopoly issue that goes along with anarchy. Okay. If, if everything is private, what is to stop one or essentially having Walmart as a state unto itself and Amazon as a state unto itself with what would essentially develop into bona fide state powers like we see them today? You would have the Walmart security force you would have the Amazon security force. They may very well go to war with each other. I guess they would if they were stealing from each other's stores. But of course, uh, a company like Walmart or Amazon, so you see, it's all about incentives. Humans act off of incentives. And, you know, so that's the whole thing is a private organization. They have an incentive to provide the best products and services or services that they can provide to their customer and at the best price. And obviously market mechanisms dictate that because if they didn't provide those things, then they would go out of business. But, you know, Walmart doesn't have an incentive to go out and enslave people because slavery is bad economics. You know, it, trying to get someone to force or trying to force someone to work, they're going to work as hard as they would as if you were paying them, you know, to do whatever they wanted with their money. And that was proven. That's why the North was phasing out slavery before the South. It wasn't, it wasn't on a moral basis. It was because the economics of it were so poor, they would have been better just hiring somebody um, instead of having to feed this person who didn't even want to work for him in the first place. And then, uh, but really, I mean, monopolies never happened, especially in a free market. Like it's, it's kind of a, and I guess you're talking about a, a militarized company, but I just don't see the demand for a domestic military 
kind of like the police, like there's there's certainly a demand for security officers to prevent to protect private property. But I think the only time that they would do anything is if incentives dictated it, which would be if someone was stealing items from the store, that would be how they earned their pay. They would prevent thieving. Well, the the incentive of the company is also to make the most profit possible. Of course, I mean, look at yes. look at Wells Fargo taking no, advantage no, 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 of people that. who That's... didn't understand that they were opening multiple accounts that had various interest rates, and then they were taken advantage of because they just didn't understand the business practices that they were engaging in. Yeah, and it wasn't until government intervention that brought all of that to no. light. No, I mean, dude, look, the, if the banks have done bad things, but it was all it was all, uh, you know, protected and incentivized by government action. Well, the activities Wells Fargo took weren't. How? That's why. The... How are they going to get their money if they loaned it out to people who could never pay it back? I don't see where that. That, well, that I'm wasn't saying what the only Wells Fargo was doing Fargo in this instance that I'm so stupid. To. The only reason Wells Fargo did something so stupid is because the Federal Reserve would just print up their money for them anyways. The FDIC would just provide that that money for them anyways. But the, the I'm not talking never, about the 2008 bank activity. I was talking I'm, about this was more recent where yeah, they were yeah, engaging no, in predatory yeah. account opening practices. Yeah, no, it's happening now. But absent the Federal Reserve printing up money and absent the FDIC insuring everybody's bank account, nobody would make bad loans. And I mean, nobody would make a loan unless they thought they were going to get their money back. So nobody would make a loan to somebody who had no prospect of ever possibly paying it back because how would they get their money? They wouldn't, you know, they, they would go broke. They'd, they'd lose the money. Well, if you're a bank as large as Wells Fargo is... I mean, they you aren't going to be that big for very long if you're loaning it out to a whole bunch of people who can't pay it back. But in terms of the predatory account practices, if they're continuing to entice people unwittingly to open all these accounts with high interest rates, it doesn't matter to Wells Fargo if the person has to take out a second job as long as they're paying it back. Yeah, and see, and this is the distinction. What what I'm talking about is loans. You're saying bank accounts. If a bank account has a high interest rate, that's beneficial to the customer. If a loan has a high interest rate, that's a negative to the customer. So what well, they're I'm doing is they're making they're making a lot of rates, loans, I should say. They're making a lot of loans with high interest rates that the customers can't pay back. Well, what what Wells Fargo did in this circumstance is that they enticed people to open up more accounts than they needed and then there were things like overdraft fees and when when a penalty was assessed that's what they were doing that was predatory that took advantage of people and it wasn't until the government took a look at it that that was brought to light and revealed to be a bad business practice right and yeah in, in no, an anarchic absolutely. society where there is no government if there's no regulation for the banks, they're they going to continue to engage in that predatory no, activity. No, they absolutely would not. No, before bank, before government gets, or sorry, absent government intervention in banks, they're incentivized to help the customer, not take from the customer. They're, they're incentivized, incentivized to, to get keep, the most money possible. Yes, and the way that they do that is convince people to loan them money in the form of a savings account so they can invest in profitable companies so that the companies can pay them dividends and they can pay their customers interest rates. But right now it's not set up like that. You're incentivized to loan as much money from the bank. And if you don't pay it back, well, big whoop, the FDIC has got the bank covered or the Fed has it covered. Right now, incentives are completely everywhere because the government is doling out all of this money and it wouldn't happen absent government. The banks would be responsible for any losses that they make. And if they're, if they're ripping their customers off, their customers would not have money to loan them and they're, they go broke. So, Banking would be much better absent the government. That 2008 would have never happened. Hell, 1929 would have never happened. But, you know, that's that's just kind of how that is, in my opinion. And I, I don't think that anybody could debate me if we had a, an hour-long debate. You could say it could happen, but the incentives aspect of it, if you look at how these people are incentivized absent government, there's no incentives to rip people off. Because if you rip people off, we've got social media. I go type on Facebook, Wells Fargo's ripping me off. Nobody's going to bank with them if they hear that. I was going to bank. They're going to go bank with whoever else. You know, I, I bank with a local bank. I don't bank with an investment bank. When I do invest, I invest with a private investor who I know isn't going to rip me off. But 
you know, that that's neither here nor there. I just don't think – see, uh, Murray Rothbard, who is a great uh, – he's a great scholar. He actually is a scholar, you know, multiple college degrees, uh, graduate degree. And he said – he's an economist, by the way. That's what his forte is. He's a, he's a Ph.D. economist. And he said that the only meaningful definition of a monopoly is a government granted privilege to provide a better service while restricting everybody else's privilege to provide the same one because the marketplace does not allow for monopolies. But Paul, I hate to cut you off, man. I think that you've got good points to make. I just really have to go because everyone in the house has been extremely quiet for my, for my uh, well-being here on the live, which I appreciate them for. But I appreciate Frauditor for uh, for hosting this, Paul. Thanks for coming up. Thanks to everybody. Whoa, whoa. Don't call me a Frauditor. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Not a Frauditor. <laughs> uh, okay. Troll. Hey, you know, troll. Thanks right, for hosting, man. Better. Always great coming on. You know, people think that we have big disagreements. We actually, we're civil for the most part. So Yeah, yeah you definitely. didn't call me a terrorist this time. Well, he, let's be honest, man. You were... sound a little bit like... I don't remember last time. I do remember calling you a terrorist. So. <laughs> but... Uh, all right. Yeah, guys, have a good one. Thanks to everybody in my chat. Thanks to everybody in uh, Fraud and Trolls chat for joining, making this thing possible. Everybody have a good day, and I will see you later. I am heading out of this live. Yeah, yeah maybe we'll do it again next week. We'll keep yeah. in touch. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. See you guys right. later. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Carroll. That was uh, quite entertaining, quite uh, learning a lot by listening to you guys you more than him that's I am, i'm sure I'm sure i come across as boring following kick but i appreciate you having me on no i like to have a you know different type of personalities uh hop in it was a lot of fun and i'm so sorry to a uh, green machine and the smoking auditor anybody that was trying to hop in there's just craig didn't have that much time he stayed two hours so yes i, I apologize if i monopolized multiple sessions that people could have had there <laughs> no no you didn't you didn't it's all he said you you made him stay longer so but uh honestly i know rogue nation is still in the in the chat rogue nation it would be great to have something like this with you because i know you like to debate and you're very passionate about your points so, you know, maybe next week we could do it with you. You let me know. And, uh, yeah, thanks so much for hopping on, everybody. But I do want to address one more thing before we go. Is, uh, uh, Mr. Carroll, are you familiar with uh, Fake Mike Real News? I can't say that I am. Auditing America? I feel like I've heard of them, but I haven't seen much or any of their content, I think. Okay. Well, he, he's, uh, he's a frauditor that walks around with a whisk and he talks into the whisk pretending it's a mic and uh, oh, anyways, you know, i think i have seen something like that <laughs> yeah yeah how could you not have seen and i've been trying for the last three days i've been talking to him trying to have him come and debate but he is just be playing really hard to get but hopefully we will having him uh, have him here next time but uh that would be quite a shit show because he, he is completely out there on his viewpoints it's it's something else for example, he says that every time he goes through a federal building, they, it's a it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment, which obviously makes no sense. And um, we've had a couple. I work at a courthouse, naturally, and we've had a couple sovereign citizens who refuse to go through security on the first floor because they claim that it's a violation of their Fourth Amendment. Yeah, and and this is just the first wacky uh, theory that he has. Uh, but yeah, Wisp Boy, I'm trying to have him come on. We'll see what happens. Uh, he, he's he's like, oh well, what are your? At first, I was like, I want to interview you and have you know questions about what you do as a frauder. He's like, no, I don't want to talk about me. If you have something you want to debate, let me know. I'm like, okay, sure. So I want to debate about the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment and you know the Constitution in general. And he says, well, well, what are your arguments? Well, what kind of nonsense is that? You're not supposed to know my arguments before the debate starts. Like, that doesn't make any sense. So anyways. One thing that I always find is telling is if you hear or even ask uh, an auditor or a sovereign citizen to recite the Fourth Amendment, uh, if they do it and leave out the word unreasonable, that tells you pretty much everything you need to know. Yeah, it's they, they always forget to mention the reasonable aspect of it. And obviously, if you're going to a courthouse where there's judge, there's a judge, there's attorneys, there's victims, they don't want you bringing a bunch of guns and cocaine. So they're going to search you. It just makes sense. 
But uh, yeah, that being said, yeah, thank you so much for being here, Mr. Carroll. I'm going to read these super chats. Well, thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, and hopefully you'll be there next time also. Hopefully there'll be more time. Who, who knows if it'll be Craig or Rogue Nation. I guess we'll we'll see when, when that time comes. Thank you so uh, we'll much. Keep an eye out. But All thanks right. again. Thank you. Take care.